The biggest detriment to DC Comics' future is lackluster or incompetent leadership and direction from Dan Didio and Associates. If Warner Media ends up licensing out DC Comics' IPs, it will likely be due to managerial malpractice. There's a recent article titled, Where Does DC Comics Fit in AT&T's Vision for Warner Media? from Forbes Hollywood and entertainment writer Rob Salkowitz, making the rounds on social media. I saw a ton of wild speculation foretelling doom and gloom for DC Comics based on the report. I wanted to put out my thoughts after reviewing the article and doing a bit of general research. For those unaware, AT&T acquired DC Comics parent company Time Warner in June 2018 for a hefty 85 billion dollar price tag and just like that distribution giant AT&T was flush with heavyweight content and creative entities like Warner Brothers, HBO, and Turner. This has left some like Rob Sokowitz speculating what place if any DC Comics has with them AT&T and Warner Media. Rob Sokowitz, a recognized expert in digital media in the global digital generation, regularly writes about comic books and comic related movies for Forbes. So he certainly has credibility in the industry. His bio describes him as a business analyst and futurist specializing in the disruptive effects of digital technology and the digital generation on work, business, and culture. He's best known in comic circles for writing Comic-Con and the business of pop culture, what the world's wildest trade show can tell us about the future of entertainment. The late Stan Lee was quoted saying, even I learn new stuff. If you're a comic book nut like me, miss it at your own risk about the book. So the contents clearly have merit. But it's not 100% faultless. One of the big conclusions the book discussed back in 2012 was the rise of digital comics distribution as a significant market force. Currently, digital comics aren't nearly the comic book market game changer many forecasted. Digital comic sales boomed from 2012 to 2014 and have maintained steady between 90 and $100 million annually. All the while, comic industry sales have grown $300 million total. Also, he's built a part of his comic industry reputation on identifying industry trends at San Diego Comic-Con, which makes him uniquely qualified, but also likely susceptible to his own professional biases. I want to give a brief disclaimer before I get into this. I was an intelligence analyst in the military for 16 years. I took sets of incomplete information and provided as clear a picture as I could to key decision makers for many years. I have a ton of experience taking circumstantial information and making sense of it. My thoughts are nothing personal against Rob Sokowitz or Forbes. I'm not saying some of his assertions aren't correct, but I do see possible holes in some of his conclusions he arrives at. Most importantly that Warner Media has no vision for DC Comics in their future. Let's get to the article so I can give my reasoning for dissenting with some of his beliefs. Earlier this month at San Diego Comic-Con, returning attendees noticed a major change on the show's massive exhibit floor. The booth of DC Comics, which had been a massive standalone pavilion in the center of the publisher's area, in the center of the hall was gone. America's oldest and second largest comic book publisher had retreated to the far back corner of the hall where it was incorporated into the multi-level Warner Media exhibit in the shadow of banks of giant monitors previewing upcoming shows and cast appearances. The subtext of this move could not have been clearer. AT&T, now the parent company of Warner Media and its divisions, including DC Comics, previously known as DC Entertainment, HBO, Turner, and Warner Brothers, does not seem terribly interested in being in the comic book publishing business. It's telling that in a long profile of AT&T CEO John Stanky this morning in Variety, DC was one of the only Warner Media brands that was not mentioned. To the extent that DC matters at all in the company's future, it's as a source of owned IP for other media channels and as a lifestyle brand to serve as an ambassador to geek culture. DC Comics moving from its long-standing position at San Diego Comic-Con may seem like Warner Media placing the brand on the back burner, but the change wasn't unexpected. DC announced via their blog on 14 July that DC and Warner Brothers are combining their booths into one big amazing mega booth offering you the chance to get up close and personal with all of your favorite entertainment. Which actually falls in line with something AT&T CEO John Stanky talks about in the previously mentioned Variety article, which I'm going to get into more detail in a moment. Stanky talks about breaking down the walls that separated previous entities acquired from Time Warner. This may in fact just be a part of their new corporate synergy. 
And across the board, AT&T is streamlining their corporate structure and overlap between content and creative entities. DC Comics had a major presence at the Warner Media Mega Booth. They still featured nearly 70 DC writers and artists. Warner Media hosted panels across four days of San Diego Comic Con. DC Comics talent and topics represented roughly a third of the panels. Tom King, Scott Snyder, Frank Miller, Dan Didio, and others were featured just as prominently as A-list Warner Media properties like Game of Thrones, Westworld, Supernatural, Riverdale, and the CW DC live action TV shows. In all honesty, why wouldn't Warner Media want to consolidate its Warner Brothers Studios, HBO, CW, and Fox Network TV shows, DC Universe, and DC Comics properties into one section? It saves money, promotes corporate synergy, and logistically is much more manageable. Rob Sockowitz's speculation about DC Comics no longer hosting their own San Diego Comic-Con booth may be correct, but he never cites a specific or anonymous source corroborating his theory. But the Warner Media Mega Booth fits the vision mentioned in recent statements from AT&T and DC Brass. Now let's talk briefly about the recent Variety profile on AT&T CEO John Stanky. I don't agree with this theory at all. I read the article and Stanky never mentions the CW Network, the Turner Networks, New Line Cinema, Castle Rock Entertainment, or the Cartoon Network. Are all these entities on the chopping block as well? I think not. In the interview, he mentions the three big brands, HBO, Turner, and Warner Brothers. The only specific entity Stanky ever mentions in the article is HBO Max, the soon-to-be-launched international streaming platform. Stanky not mentioning DC Comics or DC Anything during the interview doesn't mean a damn thing. He didn't talk about any individual corporate entities other than HBO Max in the entire profile. The only thing I take from that is HBO Max is a very, very high priority to AT&T. Let's move to the next section of the article, and, and these will be shorter, I promise. In terms of pure economics, this makes sense. The entire comics publishing business in the U.S., including periodicals, digital, and trade, adds up to around $1.1 billion dollars according to 2018 estimates by industry analyst ICV2. On a good month, about 35% of the revenue from the direct market goes to DC, along with a chunk of trade book sales for perennial titles like Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns. That wasn't ever much in the Time Warner days, and it's a smaller drop in an even bigger ocean following the AT&T acquisition. There's another ocean in play as well, an ocean of red ink. AT&T's debt following the $85.4 billion Warner Media acquisition stands at $164 billion. The company obviously believes it can monetize the Warner Media assets to make that money back quickly, but that's a huge sword hanging over their management's head and the kind of thing that gets division chiefs thinking about short-term wins rather than long-term strategy. Yes, DC Comics revenue is a tiny drop in the bucket for Warner Media. That's indisputable. Now the point about AT&T's massive $164 billion debt likely has little to no bearing on DC Comics. It's not a drain on the company and will never ever produce enough revenue to make a difference with their debt. Warner Media may indeed license DC Comics IP in the future, but the idea that closing or licensing out DC Comics will have any effect on their debts is silly. If it happens, it's likely because they don't feel publishing the comics is worth their time and a tiny fraction of money in the big picture. It's as silly as the theory I've heard that DC is going to shut down Marvel Comics because they're losing money on Star Wars. If Marvel licenses out their comics, it won't be because of the failure of the Star Wars film franchise or the flop that is Galaxy's Edge, in my opinion. Now back to Rob Sokowitz's article. One place that AT&T does not seem to see any value is sub-brands. One of the company's first moves following the acquisition was to shutter several of Warner Media's niche streaming services, including the beloved cinephile outlet Filmstruck, seen by many as a prelude to rolling as much of the company's media artillery as possible into a mega streamer to compete with Disney, Netflix, and the rest, a move that seems essential given the precipitous drop in subscribers to AT&T's satellite TV service, DirecTV. But that sentiment has also crept into the publishing side. In recent months, DC has dropped the axe on its prestige imprint Vertigo, 
the creative engine behind hits like Sandman, Preacher, Swamp Thing, Doom Patrol, and Fables. On the eve of Comic-Con, the company announced the cancellation of Mad, the venerable humor magazine that changed the face of American satire and has been continuously published since the mid-1950s. Neither of these was a big money maker in terms of month-to-month sales, but both brands occupy some valuable real estate in the psyche of fans. Even if the properties built on that land are in disrepair, it seems short-sighted to vacate the premises entirely. I think I've covered the demise of DC's Vertigo imprint thoroughly on the channel. It was sabotaged by extreme ideologies and identity politics put in place by Andy Khoury. Vertigo suffered three major scandals in the months following the Vertigo relaunch. After the initial releases, none of the Vertigo relaunch books were shipping over 6,000 issues. It was a dead brand. DC Black Label has all but replaced it, and many of the planned Vertigo titles are being released as Black Label. Also, Mad Magazine was a cultural satire icon for decades, but did it really serve any purpose in modern media? Keyboard Warriors have been making better, funnier, and edgier satire in the form of memes and YouTube content for years. I honestly don't think the shutdown of Vertigo or Mad had anything to do with Warner Media. I'm pretty sure DC Comics shut them down for being dead weight. Next topic. In place of a robust and differentiated publishing enterprise, AT&T appears more interested in boosting DC as a consumer lifestyle brand. Warner Brothers' efforts to bring DC superheroes to the big screen have been hit or miss, and suffer especially in comparison to the gleaming chrome-plated juggernaut that is Disney's MCU, but producer Greg Berlani and his team have developed a creatively and commercially satisfying empire on television with the Arrowverse, Family of Shows, Arrow, The Flash, Supergirl, and Legends of Tomorrow, plus Black Lightning. That success has bled over into several surprisingly great original series like Doom Patrol, Titans, and Swamp Thing on the DC Universe OTT service, a legacy project from the last days of Time Warner that has managed to clean the life so far in the AT&T era. DC Universe also features a chat show, DC Daily, in which a gaggle of media-friendly young people enthuse over the latest comics and comic culture offerings from the company. It's here that the lifestyle brand goals come through most clearly. The host and their over-the-top squeeing about the latest merch represents Warner Media's highest aspirations for its audience. Younger, hipper, and more ethnically and gender diverse than traditional DC Comics readership, which is old and male, even by the standards of the comic industry and dedicated to omniversally consuming everything even loosely affiliated with geek culture as part of their hip, socially mediated, comics-defined lives. Oh no, the dreaded lifestyle brand moniker is being associated with DC Comics. I did a quick search, and I can't find a single DC, Warner Media, or AT&T official ever refer to DC as a lifestyle brand. Of course, that could be their end goal, but it's never been expressly stated. DC most definitely has a robust presence on the CW network and Fox to a much lesser degree. Seeing that comic-related material is a big draw for streaming platforms, I'm sure AT&T are very happy these shows are all in place when they can finally consolidate them into one of their platforms. As far as DC Daily on DC Universe is concerned, give me a break. I make a ton of DC Comics-related content. Viewers often refute me with the words of DC execs and creators and other independent content creators. I've never had anyone ever cite DC Daily as a source of their views regarding DC Comics. I'm sure someone watches it, but I'll bet a Canadian dollar the number of views DC Daily gets is beyond minuscule compared to its reach. Yes, every comic book publisher is looking to attract the millennial audience. None have cracked the code and turned a significant portion of that audience onto their product. DC Universe honestly offers little of value for the $8 price tag. It features very little original content. The comic book library is severely thin. And worst of all, it's missing far too many important DC-related properties like the CW Arrowverse, the DCEU films, and even Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy. If anything, DC Universe is certain to be shuttered or absorbed soon with the launch of AT&T's new streaming platforms. Back to Rob Sokowitz supporting data. DC also has an edge that few people talk about in terms of logo design and iconography. Superman's S, the bat signal and Flash's lightning bolt, and other distinctive marks associated with DC characters dwarf almost everything that Marvel has on offer, with the possible exception of Spider-Man's insignia, and even gives main Disney a run for its money. 
That gives DC a permanent structural advantage in the lucrative fields of licensed merchandise and apparel that the company has never fully exploited. DC Comics licensing merchandise and apparel is a bigger earner than the comics themselves by orders of magnitude. In 2016, consumers spent a whopping $4.5 billion with a B on DC Comics merchandise. That's beyond a fact, Jack. Back to the article. So where does all that branding lead the publishing business? A generation ago, faced with a similar situation, DC's then co-president and publisher, Jeanette Kahn, appealed to Time Warner management that wanted to dramatically cut back on DC's current publishing in favor of reprints, saying the company's new material was the lifeblood of the company, a source of new fans and new IP without which the characters and related merchandise would decline into obscurity. She won that argument, and DC, under her stewardship, ended up minting many of the gold coins in which it still trades, including the Dark Knight, Watchmen, and Sandman, despite never being a gigantic engine of revenue within the Time Warner corporate umbrella. Today's DC Comics is in a similar situation. Following a demoralizing mid-decade move from its traditional home in New York to Warner Brothers headquarters in Burbank, California, the company has stumbled through various events and line reboots, milking assets like Frank Miller's once fresh take on Batman and post-Alan Moore Watchmen for the last dregs of fan appeal and relevance. And relying on high-priced milestone thousand issues of long-running titles like Action Comics and Detective Comics to make up in dollar share what they are losing in unit share of an increasingly crowded comic market. Recently, DC co-president Dan Didio publicly fumed that reissues of comics 30 and 40 years old were outselling current stories featuring the same characters, calling that a failure on us. Echoing his predecessor's warning from years past, he added, we should be focused on moving things forward, always pushing the boundaries, and finding new stories to tell. That's how we'll survive and grow this industry. Dan Didio absolutely outed himself as out of touch with DC's consumer base at San Diego Comic-Con. He believes that deconstructed, ultra-dark material like Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns are what makes DC Comics special. DC Comics is special because of the iconic characters and its connected, hopeful universe. During Didio's search for the next Watchmen, customers are inundated with constant attempts to recapture lightning in a bottle rather than creating the next game-changer for the company. See also King Tom, Alan Moore's chief third-rate imitator. Until DC Comics realizes why their material isn't resonating with readers, they're likely stuck in a rut. At this point, a regime change is likely necessary to get DC Comics back on course. He destroyed Vertigo trying to push the boundaries. Batman is nearly unrecognizable trying to redefine the character. Superman has been ripped to shreds in the name of Didio's dark, hopeless vision. Now let's cover the end of the article. Looking to the future of comic publishing, DC had a booth at the recent Book Expo trade show for the first time in more than a decade, touting its new line of teen and young adult material, much of which is published direct to trade rather than sold through comic shops. It's not the most visible part of the company, nor the most directly tied to the familiar DC brand of superheroes, but it could represent the kind of revenues necessary to keep the business alive under the looming corporate acts. Faced with a cash star corporate master with an unsentimental what have you done for me lately approach to legacy sub-brands and an urgent need to monetize its new media empire through streaming and licensing, it's not unreasonable to wonder if even Superman himself is capable of rescuing DC Comics as we've known it for the past 80 years. Everyone is trying to cash in on the very lucrative children's and teen graphic novel market. Unfortunately for DC Comics, they abandoned young readers in the 90s. They don't have much of a foothold in the market other than having notable characters. The market is flush with huge money makers and none of them are related to traditional comic book characters. If Marvel or DC Comics want to gain access to this market, it won't be via their traditional promotional efforts. They need to hire people with knowledge and success in the teen and YA graphic novel market to come aboard and lead their efforts. Until that happens, both DC and Marvel will be the proverbial monkey humping of football. They'll try really hard, while looking awkward, with little to no long-term success or gains. Before I wrap this up, I want to let you know Comic Spurge also has a video on this very topic. He's a comic book retailer and brings a different perspective to this article than me that you may find useful. There should be a link in the upper right hand corner right now. There will also be a link in the video description. If you aren't subscribed to Comic Perch, I highly suggest you do. He brings a very informed and measured approach to the industry. 
that basically covers the Forbes article about DC Comics future at Warner Media. I'm not saying Rob Salkowitz's conclusions are absolutely wrong, but I do believe the driving force behind his theory, DC Comics moving to the Warner Media booth at San Diego Comic Con 2019, is easily explained. I don't believe this is substantial proof DC Comics doesn't have a place at Warner Media. This is conjecture lacking necessary corroborating evidence. AT&T CEO John Stanky also never mentions any entity other than Warner Brothers, Turner, HBO, and HBO Max in his variety profile. DC Comics' exclusion from the profile doesn't mean anything. DC Comics publishing represents little to no impact on AT&T's massive debt holdings. I don't see the demise of Vertigo or Mad as a precursor to dropping DC Comics. Vertigo was killed by Andy Corey's mismanagement. Most of the follow-on books have already moved to DC Black Label. Mad was irrelevant in the age of memes and YouTube. DC, like everyone in traditional comics, is unsuccessfully chasing the millennial teen and YA reading audiences. Not DC Daily or anything associated with DC Universe will change that. I'll be shocked if the service lasts longer than 12 months without being rolled into a bigger streaming subscription platform. The biggest detriment to DC Comics' future is lackluster or incompetent leadership and direction from Dan Didio and Associates. If Warner Media ends up licensing out DC Comics' IPs, it will likely be due to managerial malpractice. I don't see new Batman, Superman, or Wonder Woman stories not being published in the near future. The comics may not be a huge moneymaker, but associated merchandising and IPs are huge cash cows. Rob Sokowitz provides a somewhat compelling supporting argument for his theory regarding DC Comics' presence at San Diego Comic-Con 19. But he never begins proving his initial concept correct, so it's all moot until he provides significant corroborating evidence. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a like. I would appreciate it very much. It helps us attract more views for the channel. Subscribe for future commentary, comic book news, and reviews. And don't forget to ring the bell for notifications. If you want to talk comics, movies, and much, much more, you can follow me on Twitter at Wes underscore from underscore TC. With that, Salamat Po, and I'm out.